This is the StoryWorks Roundtable, where we have conversations about craft. Because becoming a successful author begins with writing a great story. Would you like to be part of a small, dedicated group of novelists? Would you like a consistent feedback loop while you're drafting your novel? Would you like weekly calls with an experienced developmental editor and writing coach that are always responsive to your needs? Want to have your craft questions answered in real time as you work on your novel? Want a writing partner for support and accountability? Want to continually hone your craft instead of getting stuck in old writing habits? Want to be inspired? by a close-knit community of fellow writers? My summer session of group coaching for novelists is now open for registration. Go to www.wordessential.com slash fiction coaching. Get all the details about the session. Listen to past group coaching writers describe their experience with me and sign up for your free discovery call today. That's wordessential.com slash fiction coaching. Hello and welcome to this week's StoryWorks Roundtable. Today, Robert, Carly, and I are asking the question, what is genre anyway? So other than a marketing category, what is genre? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and also, I think there's some differences between marketing category and genre as well, mm. um, where there are some areas where they line up extremely well, um, perhaps thriller, for example. Um, but there are others where it's more of a marketplace and a readership than it is necessarily a genre. So people, for example, will call YA a genre, but it's not really. I mean, it has some very distinctive tropes within its subgenres. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you can have a YA thriller and you can have a YA coming of age. You can have a YA love story. So that's right. three different genres right there. Right. YA really targets an audience. It defines an age class of readers, basically. So what other distinctions do you see between genre as a marketing category and genre as a writing category? Um, well, I think genre determines what the story is trying to do. Um, and the marketing category is simply a convenient place for it to fit on the shelf, or at least it was in the old days. So, you know, again, I could probably go back to book browsing and, you know, I'd head straight to the science fiction and fantasy section and spend a few hours browsing there. Um, but within that, you're going to find all sorts of things. You'll find speculative literary fiction on one end, and on the other other end, you'll find, you know, brassy space opera, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, may be action-adventure oriented or it may be, a, um, you know, an internal arc about, someone finding their way in in a new universe so so i i still i still stand by what i say that the marketing category is a broad sweep of where something used to fit on a bookshelf that's what that's how we've come to think of it mm -hmm. but i think in craft terms genre is something that's much more finely cut um you know there's a difference between a thriller and a murder mystery for example but you might find them sitting very closely together in a marketing category Right. So how does that shape your work as the writer? Do you think about genre while you're writing? Do you set out to write a story within a particular genre? You know, Robert, you said you love to read sci-fi. So do you automatically begin to write science fiction or do you write stories that then have sci-fi elements and can be shelved there, you know? Uh, yeah, the latter. Um, and I think it's it got drilled into me a few years ago with the story grid training where you just keep coming back to if you get lost in a story and you're not quite sure where you're taking it, it's often because you're not clear on genre. And, and 
in story grid genre is very different genre is is down to the screenwriting definition of genre which is you know is this going to be a uh, a, a murder mystery with a death or is it going to be um, an internal arc with enlightenment or despair um so i think you know anytime it, it, we talked about this before a little bit in terms of coming back to theme or, or what's the controlling idea of your story which is driven ultimately by genre anyway i guess um so so yes i i definitely do i definitely come back to it so if i'm writing action adventure which is probably my preferred genre the setting is science fiction um but it's action adventure and it'll be some subset of that which might be um person against state for example um or it could be person against nature because i quite like those as well but mm -hmm. Generally speaking, I'm I'm interested being having always grown up a rebel. I grew up in the punk era, <laughs> so you know, person against state is close to my heart. Even though probably I'm a middle class conformist these days. <laughs> right. So has genre drilled down too much? Do people put too fine of a point on genre? Because you know, as you were pointing out, Robert, you could write. A book that falls in the sci-fi category in you know Barnes and Noble, but within that, it's going to be you know person against state. It's going to be there are maybe three or four tiers that you mentioned just in your description of what kind of story you like to write. So, do we get too nitpicky with genre? Are we creating subgenres and sub subgenres as a way to try to find a niche and you know maybe make ourselves stand out a little bit from the giant outer genre category when we are marketing um i i think that's where authors get confused they because of the, the business side of the of right to market um they get confused that the market is the genre and it's not mm -hmm. um and and so you know you've got to come back to story. What is the story conveying? And if the genre is action adventure, then what's at stake is life and death. So, you know, if it turns into a romance halfway through, then we've done the classic genre mashup and then the reader doesn't know what they've bought and mm -hmm. doesn't, wouldn't matter which shelf it sat on. It would be disappointing because it's not clear what the story is. So I think from the author's point of view, we have to separate the both out, which does get tricky in, in, the self-published world because we are being trained to write to, correctly i think right to market because to break through commercially we don't have the power of the big four behind us to go and force big retailers to take massive cases of books um which is really what puts them in front of eyes the best way we can get eyes on our books is to make sure that it's very clear what it is in a very specific Amazon category, for example, to use Amazon as an example. Mm -hmm. um, but still, that means that you've got to then say, what am I delivering to the reader? Um, yes, I'm going to be in sci-fi romance. Um, but if then within that, I end up writing a story that's all about life and death, I've not necessarily addressed the types of stories that the readers might be looking for within that marketplace. Mm -hmm. So it, it, there is a blur. I, I'm not saying they're completely indistinct, but I think we can easily conflate the two when they're that when they shouldn't be. And when you're in your creative mind, what I think serves us best from the point of view of crafting a great story is to be very, very clear on what the controlling idea is and what genre you're writing, and mm. not what marketplace you're writing. Right, right. So I, if that makes sense, it <laughs> it does, and I'm gonna split a semantic hair here. I totally agree with you that we need to know what our controlling idea is and our theme and be very clear on our character and plot arcs on our trajectories through the story and not confuse the reader. So I agree with everything you said, except I would not choose to write to market. I would write the story I want to write and then find the genre it fits in or the genre and subgenre that it fits in, you know, so as a writer who wants to write a story, regardless of the marketplace, and craft it as well as I can, um, there's a piece of me that bristles at the idea of writing to a category 
in order to find a reader. Mm. I remember taking a, a writing workshop specifically on plot around the time when the Twilight books were reaching their mm. zenith. Mm-hmm. And I remember um, the question came up in class. Well, when you see a market, especially related to a topic that's really hot, like vampires uh-huh. or like whatever, whatever the thing, the thing of the month or year is, and you have this story that you've been working on and don't you want to get it out as fast as you can to take advantage and ride that wave. And it was really interesting because the the person, the published author, you know, leading the workshop said, Well, you know, certainly that's your choice. However, consider the speed at which these things happen. And as soon as you get your vampire story out there, the vampire wave might be gone, Mm -hmm. for example. And so her advice to to the group assembled was kind of along the lines of what you're saying, Alita, which is especially as it relates to topics, don't don't um, write something just because it seems like there's a hot market for it Mm -hmm. to write the story that you want to write. and you know, find find where it fits from a marketing perspective. Right, right. And so I think going back to the idea of semantics, I would not use the word genre in my vocabulary in the same way I would use theme or plot arc or whatever to help me structure and identify where I'm heading and the, you know, the topical uh, au courant aspect of what you're saying, Carly, just made me think of this summer looking at some of the um, publishers' weekly emails of what's going to press, you know, today, what's hot this week. There were a lot of books written by authors who are people of color that have to do with social justice, that have to do with inequality in society. And it always kind of blows me away that this thing happened, and here are all of these books, because I know those books weren't written last week. You know, (laughs) not that many of them, maybe one or two or three authors can create that kind of outline and generate that word count in a month or two. But most of these people are previously unestablished authors with the big presses. And so it took them you know, a year for that book to um, be part of the press's machinery. And before that, maybe a year to find an agent. And before that, maybe a year or more, five years to write it. So the idea of writing anything to market um, or to, to, to hot topic to <laughs> news of the day is mind boggling to me. Yeah, right. So again, I think you know we've we fall into the trap of confusing writing to trend, marketplaces, and genre. And they, in my mind, they are three completely different things. Right. So out of those publishers' weekly things, for example, any one of those might be set in a society with a person of color battling issues of social justice but they could they could be a mystery they could be a thriller they could be a coming of age they could be an internal arc so that's what i mean by genre mm-hmm. i think um the confusion comes when somebody tries to jump on the tw- say a twilight trend so our oh, vampires are hot i write a story about vampires but they miss the fact that what everybody fell in love with was an age-old love story and it had nothing to do with vampires. Um, it just, you know, it was an unusual kind of cute setting. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and, you know, you could argue that Fifty Shades of Grey exactly knew what that was, that trope was all about. It was, it was a, a hot romance of <clears throat> mismatched, um, a mismatched couple that had to come to term. I don't know. You know, I haven't read Twilight, uh-huh. so I couldn't tell you. <laughs> right. Making it up as I go along now. Um, so, yeah, I, I, this is where I think it all gets very blurred and mm-hmm. it can confuse, I suspect it can confuse the self-published author more because we live in a much more commercial marketplace. If you join any of the Facebook groups, they're constantly talking about, well, not constantly talking about writing to market, but, you know, getting their books sold and getting visibility. 
And that can be challenging, Mm -hmm. especially if you've written something that does cross a marketplace and then also mashes genre together. So then you go, how do I get this in front of people? And if it went through the Trab publishing series of gatekeepers, it would probably get cleaned up along the way because they might say, no, we can't sell um, you know, a murder mystery with a, a strong romance subplot that's set on Mars. You know, it's mm-hmm. just we can't sell it because they don't know how to position it because they've got limited shelf space. Right. Obviously, with huge companies like Amazon, we have we do have the ability to drill down to to tiny marketplaces mm-hmm. where there are very specific truck expectations perhaps. And I think that's where Chris Fox was coming from was saying, look, if you can find hungry readers out there that want the story, the types of story that they can't get enough of, and you can write those stories and you like those stories, that's what you want to be looking for, not jumping on trends. And people misappropriated what he was talking about mm-hmm. to be, you know, hey, military sci-fi is hot, get in there and write some, you know, and that's right. not what he meant at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, you raise a really interesting point, Robert. The, you know, Twilight, you said, is a mismatched love story, star crossed lovers, but you would never put Twilight next to Romeo and Juliet, right? So yeah. is the genre of love, you know, love against obstacles, mismatched lovers, whatever, or is the genre vampires? right? Is it romance? And so we're, as writers, we have to craft that story that we want to tell that has all of those human elements and all of that emotional content and compelling action. But then when it comes to finding readers, we do have to sort of put our story through a series of funnels to find that reader who's going to want a vampire high school version of Romeo and Juliet, you know. I'd like to return to the point for my own edification. I'd love to hear what both of you have to say about reader expectations and how that relates to genre. Um, Because I picked up on something when I joined a book club in my neighborhood uh, a couple years ago. In the book club in my neighborhood, I live live in a rural area, so this encompasses tens of miles, this neighborhood. (laughs) But it's mostly um, women who are mostly women, mostly women who are about 30 or so, 20 to 30 years older than me. Um, a lot of, and, and it's the kind of book club where everyone brings a book that they've been reading. It's not a common read. You bring a book you've been reading that you enjoy, that you want to share with the group and talk about it and present it to the group um, as, a, as a way of raising awareness about a particular title and sharing books, literally passing around books. And I learned something as I was listening to my fellow book club members talk about a lot of the romances that they were reading. And I think I hadn't been really tuned in to romance. And I'm going to use the wrong, are we saying romance as a genre or romance as a category, as a marketing category? What do we think (laughs) in terms of terminology before I go on? Uh, There are, to me, there are several different types of romance. So Yes, and that's where I'm going. Yeah, go. We'll go. Carry on. Can I can I go there? Okay. So sure. I was so kind of generally was thinking of this category. We keep we keep we kept having these books come to the book club that I would consider romances, but it was very interesting as a writer to observe my fellow readers how they were very interested in different kinds of romances. That a person brings up a book that I would consider a romance, and half of the other romance readers in the room said, "No, that's not for me. That is." Um, uh, you know, too, too much sex, not cozy enough. Um, I didn't feel any emotional connection with the characters. Um, maybe there was an element of danger that they didn't like. Whereas another uh, reader would be disappointed in a different book because um, the setting wasn't rich enough for her or it wasn't happening in the right kind of time and place in the universe. So I thought I found that really interesting when to me, it, you know, as someone who hadn't read a lot of romance books coming into this club thought, well, I don't know what, what makes a book different. And so from a writer's perspective, it was really interesting to see that these readers had very specific um, preferences and Mm -hmm. to get other recommendations from readers who liked the same books they did was really powerful and really sent them down a particular path. It wasn't, Oh, who has a good romance? It was, it has to have X, Y, and Z things. That was fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and I think that's where 
genre as a marketing series of funnels um, and genre as helping us establish guidelines for our craft come together because yeah. you need right. to know which reader to reach out to because if you get it wrong, you're going to disappoint <laughs> a lot of people who end up with your book. And so there's that marketing piece, but also if you know you really love writing rich settings and you know non-graphic romantic scenes of intimacy instead of hot steamy intimate scenes then you can look at those reader expectations and use them as a kind of benchmark to make certain that you are going to target or you are going to satisfy your readers which again that that little piece of me bristles and says but I don't want to think about that when I'm writing I just want to be like the pure artist and write the story, you know, and I don't think it's right or wrong to be that way or the other way. It's, mm. it's, we each have our own approach to the writing process. Those might be great benchmarks or a great roadmap for another writer who really wants that kind of structure and who really wants to think about hitting those targets as they draft their story, you know, whereas that's just not my creative um, style. That's an interesting way of putting it for me, I think, is the idea of genre as structure and having targets to hit to meet those reader expectations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. There, <clears throat> there are de I, in my mind, there are definitely genre conventions, as, as Sean Coyne outlines. And, and it, the more I thought about it, the more I thought that's, that's really clear. And that some of those cross over to marketplace expectations, as you say, Carly, especially with things like romance, where it becomes much clearer where some romance readers will demand a happily ever after, even even though they so they know the ending in question. But then if you think about that, it's no different to action adventure. You know it's life or death. And realistically, most of us want the hero to win. Most of us want the hero to, to or at least be successful, you know, win but lose, you know. So they win the overall story, but they lose something in ex in the execution because there was a cost. Um, and, and so I think those conventions and expectations are hugely important. Um, particularly, they become your guiding light, I think, when you're both drafting and revising to, to say, okay, my artistic feel, you know, the thing that I was channeling when I, when I produced my art, um, how do I now shape that, that it meets as many expectations as I felt it should when I came up with the, the idea for it? Um, and I don't mean a leader that, you know, we should necessarily go back and say, oh, okay, I should take that thing, you know, where the, the elephant comes in from the jungle and tramples the village. I should take that out because it's going to disappoint <laughs> people, you know. Right. It's, it, it's, it's, it's sort of like, okay, I need to know what my story is aiming for and if, if that ends up being a genre which is confused, then mm -hmm. I think we will struggle to have to to address reader satisfactions. Um, you know, if what starts out as a love story then barrels into some kind of suspense and ends in a thriller with the victim at the you know the mercy of the villain, then the readers might be scratching their head at the end, going, well, "What did I just read?" <laughs> right, uh, right, yeah, and I, you know, as I'm listening to our conversation too, I was thinking about my mysteries because obviously they are genre fiction. And I didn't start writing them thinking, well, I don't want to have a body at the opening because I don't like genre conventions and reader expectations. I, I had that framework in mind, but then I also played with it and wrote what I wanted to. And so it was maybe more of a subconscious roadmap than when I was actively trying to target. And, you know, my stories, instead of being a whodunit or a how done it, because I'm right up front with that uh, throughout the book, it's a why done it. And it's a now what? Like, <laughs> okay, if you know who the killer is and who's dead, and that his cross is pathing with my protagonist, but now what? How is that going to unfold for these characters? Yeah. And so I was able to play with my approach 
to those um, genre conventions and reader expectations. And so, you know, for me, if I can just put them in the subconscious trunk of my mind and then go play, I'm happy. But I'm not, I'm not consciously pushing against them or rejecting them. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's brilliant. I, I, you know, I think that's when you when you reach a level of your craft where you know the the world that those types of readers inhabit because you inhabit it. You know, you're writing mm-hmm. books that you would love to read yourself. I think that's where we all probably start anyway. Um, and so you're writing for yourself as an audience of one, but it expands out, and which is why. When people say, oh, I really want to write, say, you know, I want to write police procedurals. Okay, well, have you read any? No. Right. My first recommendation would be, well, go and you know read the top 20 bestsellers at least. Mm-hmm. So you get a feel for how that genre plays out. Um, and you've cl- you're very clear about that, Alita. You're, okay, okay, I know how this, I know the expectations are body in chapter one or in the you know, first 20% mm-hmm. or whatever. But if you know what's expected, you can play with it and innovate. And that's where the, I think really delightful stories come from because you're firmly within the genre and you, you can feel that the author's played with this. You can feel that the story is bringing it, but you don't know how. And that's the exciting thing, I, I think. So, right. and, and, and that does take a level above, which is why, I pose the question, you know, so what is genre? It's so mm-hmm. nebulous. It's it's both clear and unclear and gets so confused with marketing categories that people forget that, you know, writing a love story isn't the same as writing a romance with a happily ever after. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Now, Carly, you've written a YA sports novel, correct? So yes. do you... Did you have genre expectations or reader expectations in mind when you wrote or were you, you know, happily oblivious to that aspect and just writing the story you wanted to tell? What was your approach? It's interesting because I didn't know at first that I was writing a YA novel, Mm -hmm. um, that I started writing this story. It turned out that the the hero of my story was a 17-year-old girl who plays basketball um, I knew that sports would be an important part of the story. And so then, I guess to answer your question more directly, in, in, when I got to the point of revision, I think I became more aware of what some of the genre expectations were for YA, for one, or I should say, in a coming of age, because I, I yes. think in, in the context of our story, I would call this genre coming of age. Yes. Um, in the YA category or in the yes. YA marketplace understanding what some of those expectations and what some of those conventions were. Um, And also, interestingly, I learned along the way with some valuable reader feedback, what some of the tired tropes of Mm. both the genre and the, and specifically of the YA in the YA world were. Um, One of them was shocking to me because it was the, um, uh, the grief and kind of post-life guidance of a grandparent. And I thought, well, this, Grandma Benny is really important in this story. It turns out there are a lot of Grandma Bennies uh, out there in in YA literature. Um, but that was useful to know. I didn't know that. You know, I hadn't I hadn't read. I should say I hadn't read contemporary YA literature enough. I had loved it when I was younger, um, when I was in that marketplace category, age wise. Um, the sports piece of it is interesting too because I think that's where I felt I had the most. Um, play space that's where i felt like i had some intuitive command of what's expected of a action story um which i think Carly, helped me you froze a, for a second yes. you froze oh. for a second you think you had some and then it broke up i don't know oh. if it broke up for you robert or but just in case it Not broke so up much, on the sorry. recording okay so I think with the sports part of the story, I had a more intuitive sense of what some of the expectations of a sports action story required or or what was expected from a sports action story. I think as a result, I chose a point of view that worked because I think that's something too, um, in order to kind of properly convey or or in a in an exciting way convey what's happening in these sports action scenes and these, you know, competitions. Um, having the right point of view kind of makes it easier for your character to move around. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, but I think because I had this had a more familiar and perhaps intuitive sense, um, I could play around with it a little bit more and kind of subvert even. And, you know, and that's where I think it got really fun for me was subverting some of the expectations of the, you know, underdog story or the, uh, that's, you know, a, a version of a sports story or the, will they or won't they make it to the championship? What happens when you win or don't win the championship game? I'm being a little vague here, but mm-hmm. I just feel like um, perhaps most of the genre consciousness and audience consciousness, you know, marketplace, I guess, came after the initial draft. Mm-hmm. Interesting, yeah, because you, you would have had an overall um, education plot, which is probably what coming, coming of age is. It's, it's a worldview education. So is that sort of revelationary? Hey, it's still different to how I thought it would be, mm-hmm. um, and 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 so hopefully we wise up. But mm-hmm. it was underpinned by a sports performance genre, which is really interesting. So that's that's and it sounds like you became very clear about that once you were back in revision mode. So you understood how one affected the other, um, and, and and I like the idea of subverting it. You reminded me of um, it's a movie, but uh, 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 bring it on the cheerleader competition movie. Yeah. Have you seen that? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's yeah. a wonderful performance story, but it it's also it's more than just a performance story. The performance story underpins what is effectively probably coming of age. I, I'd have to go back and think about it more clearly. Um, where they don't win, but, right. but it's unbelievably satisfying. So very, yeah. very clever. Yeah. So. So nice. Yeah, it's good observations there. Mm-hmm. And I ended up at, recently, Robert, there was an article I read um, about how how genius Bring It On is as right. a as um, cultural commentary or commentary about cultural appropriation, that there's this idea that in this cheerleading universe, cheers are stolen, right? And yeah, yeah. Stolen from one school that's of this, you know, privileged, well-heeled community from a kind of scrappier school in a different part of los angeles and there's a racial element i mean it's really like something that seems like it would be cheerleading competition on the surface ends up having all these very satisfying layers as you say i think this brings us back around to the idea of the umbrella genre and then the subgenres and sub sub genres and we need those you know so Carly, are you writing a sports competition story with a coming of age character element? Or are you writing a coming of age story with a sports competition plot? And, you know, you could have the sport plot or the romance plot or whatever plot, but what's going to make your story live on in your readers' minds is your characters and their evolution through that arc. And so, you know, where genres maybe become confused and seem like mashups is because we always have that plot arc element and that character arc element. So it's the sports coming of age story, you know, and maybe in some stories you emphasize the sports and the teamwork and the competition and that, you know, happy triumph at the end. And in other stories, you emphasize the character arc and the emotional growth and the developing worldview through the, you know, venue of teams and competition and winning and losing and all of those different aspects. So, you know, as writers and getting clear on what we're actually writing and what our story is about, as Robert said at the beginning, I think we need to decide which comes first, right? Am I writing a story of personal evolution, that coming of age piece, or am I writing a story of underdog triumph, that sports piece? Totally, totally, yeah, and and uh, it's exactly the point I, I wanted to try and clarify because I I think that is what gets confused with writing for marketplaces. Yes. So when people say I want to write a YA story, say okay. <laughs> You, so you want people who like YA literature to be interested in it. You know, what type of story are you going to write that appeals to them? Because there are, you know, you've got Twilight YA and then you've got John Green, 14 Our Stars YA. So, you know, what end of that spectrum do you, you, is your story pitching at? Oh, no, it's just going to be this beautiful, you know, young adult, uh, yeah, Hunger Games. 
I don't know. <laughs> what, where, right. where are you going to go with that? You know, right. so, you know all, all we know probably is that the marketplace itself would expect an age range of a protagonist. Mm-hmm. And and probably having them, you know, pitted up against the world in some way, shape, or form, whether it's an intimate world like a love story or a big world like a Hunger Games. But o- outside of that, you've got to then pick: am I, you know, how am I driving this? As you say, leader, is it going to be coming of age or is it going to be a sports performance? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And both could fit within YA, as Cardi has clearly articulated. I think that's a great reminder or a great way to think about it is what is driving this story? What is, what is the thing, what is at the heart of it? Yes. You know, mm-hmm. so, so we don't get confused about what our, what our genre or our purpose or our audience is. Yeah. Right. Those are the words of wisdom. My newsletter, a room full of books and pencils is growing every week with new reflections, writing tips and transcripts of the podcast. It's also where I make announcements about things like upcoming writing workshops and coaching sessions. Check out a room full of books and pencils at booksandpencils.substack.com. Thank you for listening to the StoryWorks Roundtable. Find all our shows, show notes, and videos at storyworkspodcast.com.